welcome back to the Explaining History podcast. And uh, in this podcast, I'm going to talk about the early moments, the early months of the Spanish Civil War, about Hitler and Mussolini's involvement, and about the kind of character that General Francisco Franco was, and how the uh, rebel generals were able to transport their army from Spanish Morocco onto the mainland uh, and to attack the Republic. Um, this is going to be a kind of a little two-parter, really, because later on, I think either tonight or tomorrow, when I have a moment, I'm going to be talking about war reporting during the Spanish Civil War. And if you've been listening recently, you'll know that war reporting is uh, a particular interest of mine. We've talked about uh, journalism during the First World War, um, and we're going to return to that theme as well in the near future. But it's an interesting kind of kind of crossover of these uh, two strands. Uh, we've done on this podcast in the last couple of months, I think, though time does fly. Uh, call it the last year. Uh, several podcasts on Spain, particularly Stalin's involvement. Now, previously, I've mentioned uh, Peter Preston's uh, brilliant book, uh, The Spanish Holocaust. And today I've been looking mainly at uh, Spain in Our Hearts by Adam Hochschild, which is the story of the American volunteers in the Spanish Civil War. Um, the other book that's always worth a read is Unlikely Heroes by Richard Baxall, um, which I've mentioned several times. It's a great read about the British volunteers to the battalions that made up the International Brigade. Spain was a curious anomaly within uh, Europe. It was a Western European country, a southwestern European country, uh, that was, by 1936, a democratic and yet still a largely feudal society. Spain had remained neutral in the First World War, but it had suffered the economic consequences that swept across Europe as a result. And Spain, whilst it had remained neutral in the First World War, was still a deeply violent society, mainly the uh, violence of the landowners directed at the, the poor, the, the landless poor in Spain, were accounted for much of that. And the podcast that I did a while ago uh, about class war in Spain is well worth returning to if you haven't listened to it already, because it sets out much of the background of what I'm going to talk about here. There was, in the decade before the Spanish Civil War, essentially a, a, a low level and at some points a quite pronounced class war between the landowners and the, uh, the poor landless peasants. The landowners existed in a cartel or a, a coalition with the Catholic Church, with uh, senior army officers and monarchist politicians of the right. In 1931, uh, following uh, municipal elections, which uh, were heavily, which heavily favoured anti-monarchic parties, King Alfonso left Spain, and as a result, a republic was uh, declared that lasted till 1939, when it was overthrown by Franco. And the republic uh, made a dramatic shift to the left in 1936, when the socialists, uh, communists, and other parties of the left. Uh, work together under a popular front. An election on the 16th of February won uh, 263 members of parliament, uh, which outnumbered the 156 right-wing parliamentarians, which were grouped within the National Front Coalition, um, with the uh, Carlists and Monarchists, um, and CEDA. CEDA being the Spanish Confederation of the Autonomous Right, which was an umbrella term for a coalition of Catholic, uh, conservative and proto-fascist organisations that saw themselves really as the bastion, the bulwark of uh, um, Catholic Christendom in Spain to fight against um, Bolshevism um, and against the Jews. Ironically, the Jews had been expelled from Spain en masse in the 15th century by uh, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella in uh, 1492, particularly tragic year for most of humanity, 
and um, the idea that the right put forward, and particularly uh, a large number of um, Catholic extremists, was that the, the Jews were still influencing Spain and causing trouble amongst the working class and the rural poor, that really uh, the Jews were responsible for the transmission of Marxism and anarchism and other left-wing doctrines to Spain. And this is a delusion that is popular across much of Europe, of course, to associate uh, Jews with uh, communism. The Nazis had uh, made this uh, bogus association and it had been made as early as 1917 and the, the Russian Revolution. Uh, so happened that many uh, revolutionaries were Jewish, but obviously there were large numbers who weren't. The, there's a, an interesting kind of racial subtext to the discourses around the peasants and the left, in that the peasants were often referred to by the landowners as Moors, the, the peasants were seen as almost a separate and inferior subcategory of human being by uh, many of, of the landowners. And ironically, when the generals in Spanish Morocco wanted to bulk out their colonial forces, who were largely European Spanish, they hired Moroccan Muslim troops and used a, a, a variety of anti-Semitic ideas uh, anti-Semitic arguments to uh, suggest that really the uh, they would be uh, not only paid for their services but would be liberating Spain from the Jews. So despite the fact that there were almost no Jews in Spain, anti-Semitism was still a powerful device used by the Spanish generals to help overthrow the Republic. Adam Hochschild has a, an interesting uh, quote here that's worth uh, examining. He says, To the coterie of generals leading the new revolt, however, democracy itself was profoundly threatening and the victory of the Popular Front coalition in the latest election was an anathema. They were convinced that it would lead, Spain, uh, lead to a Spanish version of the Russian Revolution. The military rebels called themselves nacionales, a term rather stronger, the, um, the historian P. Paul Preston explains, in its connotations of the, uh, of the only true Spaniards than the usual English rendition of nationalists. So nationales doesn't mean nationalists in the sense that they are people who are what we call patriotic or um, xenophobic they view themselves as the only people who can legitimately be classed as Spanish at all. Therefore, people with anti-Catholic or secularist or anti-monarchical um, or socialist views are not even part of the nation itself, not even part of the national tribe or body. They are uh, in some way uh, foreign to... And this means that... Spanishness in the eyes of the generals wasn't it wasn't a kind of a linguistic community it was an ideological one. General Franco was not the uh, leader of the revolt initially. Um, he was one of the the more important plotters, but he was not necessarily a, a wildly charismatic figure or somebody who was, uh, had a particular stature. He was extremely well organised and ruthless. Um, the suggestion from Adam Hochschild is that his uh, small stature, um, his uh, rather unattractive um, visage and his uh, reedy high-pitched voice um, meant that he was never going to be the the kind of the hail and well-met fellow um, that perhaps Mussolini was. Instead, he earned a reputation for, and I quote here, cool mastery of detail and iron discipline, even, it, even when it meant ordering the disobedient soldiers to be shot. Franco had a reputation for competence and skill and thoroughness. He was the director of the National Military Academy. Um, he was removed, this was uh, an institution that was shut down uh, from uh, by the Republic 
and the the consequences of that are are quite significant. Not only were people like Franco sent to um, the Canary Islands and also to uh, Morocco, where it was thought they would be out of the way and no more trouble. Um, the army itself viewed itself as coming under existential uh, attack, and it viewed itself as really being the guardian of the nation. So the coup uh, was partly aided by the Republic's poor decisions. Sending Franco away simply meant that he had uh, a large amount of leeway to plot and to plan. Most of the coup organisers have a common background in Morocco. They are referred to as the Africanistas. These are veterans of colonial fighting uh, from the 1920s onwards uh, against the, the Berbers, the uh, mountainous tribes people of Morocco, uh, who had defied and fought off the French in the 19th century and were a very formidable opposition. The experience of fighting for Spain in Morocco and of colonial life in general had created a culture amongst the generals and senior officers that they were the true uh, representatives of what it meant to be Spanish. They were the custodians of Spanish culture and history. They were the avant-garde of uh, Spanish civilization, spreading it to lesser peoples in their eyes uh, in North Africa. And they were determined not to see a, a lesser culture, as they saw it, emerge back in on the Spanish mainland. If you imagine these were men who had a, a profound sense of racial superiority over those that they had conquered in Morocco, and they saw something as racially degenerate amongst the Spanish peasants themselves. And the moment that the Spanish peasants have a degree of political power, then the essence of Spain itself, in the eyes of the generals, is about to be swept away. And when the colonial ideas that had been fostered in Morocco, with an immense amount of violence and bloodshed, were transported back to Spain, the colonised people would be themselves the poor Spanish. And part of the horror of the Spanish Civil War, the level of brutality um, and cruelty that was inflicted on Spanish civilians can be explained from this fact that a colonising army had returned to the Spanish mainland and were now carrying out the practices that they had come long ago to see as pretty normal. The men of the Army of Africa that was commanded by Franco and his colleagues, um, which also made up a, uh, foreign le a Spanish foreign legion, were often criminals who had managed to avoid jail, who had had their sentences commuted in return for military service. But as mentioned, a large uh, par portion of the army were made up of Arab or Berber recruits. And one of the great ironies is that the term Moor, um, a uh, derogatory term to describe Arab and North African people, by the generals and Spanish officers that was also applied to the Spanish poor um, was also used as a, a, a catch-all term for Muslim soldiers in Franco's army. Franco, who had been seconded to the Canary Islands, was flown by a British aircraft to uh, Morocco to take command of the Army of Africa against the wishes of the Spanish Republic, the uh, sympathisers, Franco's sympathisers in London, along with, so it is suggested in uh, many histories of the era, uh, the help of MI6, who viewed the emergence of the uh, popular front in Spain, along with the popular front in France, with great alarm and believed that this was part of a, a Stalinist plan for the takeover of Southern Europe, uh, the uh, British security services at least uh, turned a blind eye to the flight that was organised in London, helping 
Franco to get to Morocco, and so it is uh, suggested, uh, actively encouraged it. It was hoped that the Spanish navy would be the means by which the army could transport itself uh, across the Straits of Gibraltar into, North, in, into Spain, but the navy were declared for the Republic when there was a naval mutiny, the uh, senior officers in the navy were killed by their troops, their sailors, and the uh, our navy was removed as a device from the general's control. In sheer desperation, Franco sent envoys to Hitler and to Mussolini. The uh, envoys that reached Hitler got him on a good day. Hitler had been to see a performance of Wagner's Siegfried, his favourite opera, and he received a handwritten letter from Franco describing his uh, situation and um, asking for help. The conversation that Hitler has with uh, Franco's emissaries, uh, which transpires to be much of a, a kind of a, sh a shouting monologue, from Hitler resulted in Hitler finally deciding to agree to give uh, Franco any help he needed. Now there are a number of possible interpretations for this. Adam Holtzchild argues that it was um, a way of Hitler who was fed up with what he viewed as the uh, derogatory attitude by Europe's uh, democratic states towards him, of him um, asserting some kind of power and creating a nightmare situation in Spain for uh, liberal democracy. But Richard J. Evans uh, has uh, an alternate thesis, and it goes something like this. Uh, apologies, Professor Evans, if you're listening, and I've not quite got this one absolutely right. That Hitler looked to the Soviet Union and believed that the uh, internationalism of the Soviet Union, Comintern and that sort of thing, was resulting in popular fronts in France and Spain. There was no doubt something in this. A popular front government in France would mean that uh, Stalin would have an ally in Western Europe. If Hitler, and he always intended to, attacked the Soviet Union, he would have, Stalin would have a client state on Hitler's flank. So, when the possibility of another client state, uh, Stalin's client state emerged in Spain, Hitler thought he would subvert this, thus creating a fascist client state, um, which would point in uh, the, uh, f the southern flank of France, uh, the Pyrenees, and then give, uh, create a, a kind of a stalemate situation. Um, and would uh, inevitably, eventually, lead to the um, pl further plans for Operation Barbarossa later on to go uh, unhindered. How much Hitler thinks things through on this level, I'm not sure. My overall view of Hitler's decision-making is that it works within a, a, a big framework, but it is entirely impulsive. So the view that Adam Hochschild has is, isn't inconsistent with that. The way Ian Kershaw talks about Hitler's uh, planning is that he spoke to his colleagues and his subordinates in broad and uh, vague visions and would sometimes decisively intervene in matters and other times be uh, strangely removed and indifferent. And the uh, chaos that this leads to in Hitler's decision-making sometimes actually drives events forwards. It shouldn't be forgotten uh, that Mussolini actually plays a huge part in helping Franco. Uh, Mussolini believes that the having a, a Spanish fascist state uh, would be a huge benefit to himself and that he would have a client, a client indebted to him in the Mediterranean, which was principally what he sought to be able to uh, control. What transpired from Franco's appeal to Hitler and Mussolini was the first major airlift in history. 15,000 troops were flown to Seville in the course of uh, a few days, and had it not been for the intervention of Hitler and Mussolini at this time, principally Hitler, there's every chance that the general's coup would have been an embarrassing failure.
Another power to assist Franco was the uh, dictatorship uh, next door in the guise of Portugal. 8,000 Portuguese uh, troops uh, volunteered in Franco's Foreign Legion. They allowed the port of Lisbon to be used as a resupply base for the uh, generals, and they provided the generals with uh, bases for aircraft and landing fields, and equipped them with munitions when they were running short. The other thing that they handed over were Republican refugees, who were universally executed when they were handed over to the nationalist armies. And that fate was shared by countless uh, trade unionists, peasant activists, and even innocent civilians up and down Spain. Terror in Spain during the Spanish Civil War was indiscriminate, and the point was that it, a, a political terror in the eyes of Franco had to be indiscriminate. If it was targeted at specific enemies, then the entire nation would not be terrorised into submission. But as long as when uh, um, rebel troops turned up in uh, particular towns, everybody from the uh, local shopkeepers to school children uh, were executed or mutilated or tortured, then that meant that the terror had a far greater political and ideological impact. To make that point, Adam Hock's child says, if, tar if the targeting of those killed made no sense, as in Huesca, for example, where a hundred supposed Freemasons were shot in a town where the order boasted less than a dozen members, it hardly mattered. The resulting panic still inspired fear. Spanish Freemasons were in the plot of science because they had long been anti-clerical. Such massacres happened everywhere, whether the advancing nationalist forces met resistance or not. It is necessary to spread terror, declared General Emilio Mola, the coup's initial leader. We have to create the impression of mastery by eliminating without scruples or hesitation all those who do not think as we do. Anyone who helps or hides a communist or a supporter of the popular front will be shot. And in that statement, there's a, a sort of a snapshot of the merciless nature of modern civil wars, where it is very difficult to simply remain a civilian or a bystander, and where both sides are motivated by is dark and tribal and ideological hatreds which are utterly com uncompromising. Anyway, um, I'm going to continue, as I said, um, with this theme on the Spanish Civil War, and we're going to look at war reporting um, a little bit later. I'll record something tonight. I hope you found it useful, and um, if you do uh, find these podcasts useful, if you can support us on Patreon, that would be great, um, or give us a good review on iTunes. Thanks very much. All the best. Bye-bye.